In the northeast of Thailand, a family of enormous stone whales swim through a forest. These aren't real whales, of course. They're actually a part of a 75 million year old rock formation. A long time ago, this part of Thailand was just a desert. The movements of the Earth's crust push sandstone up to create these fascinating mountains. Reachable by anyone willing to spend a day hiking up the network of trails, this landmark is becoming increasingly popular with tourists. Once you reach the back of one of the whales and look down on the endless sea of green below, you'll know why. On these hikes, you'll find waterfalls, a wide variety of exotic plants and animals, and from the very top, you can even look straight across to the neighboring country of Laos. Their shapes look just like whales swimming together. No wonder this place is called Three Whale Rocks. What a way to see Thailand on the back of a giant stone whale. While digging in a Canadian mine in March 2011, a worker made a shocking discovery. They found a nearly perfectly preserved nodosaur specimen. This extinct dinosaur weighed in at around 3,000 pounds and grew to 18 feet. Despite being over 110 million years old, the nodosaur was so well preserved that you can clearly see the heavy body armor and scaly skin that covered it. It took almost an entire year of painstaking work to uncover the incredible find. The fossil was finally unveiled in a Canadian museum in 2017. Unexpectedly, analysis of the skin showed shading that the nodosaur may have been capable of camouflage, like modern-day geckos and moths. This is in addition to the spines and scales that already make it a walking tank. Still being studied today, this nodosaur could go down as one of the most important fossils discovered in a long time. Its detail could help us to uncover even more of the mysteries of the past. The Voynich Manuscript is the world's most mysterious document. Since its discovery in 1912, the manuscript has been a complete mystery to everyone that comes across it. It is heavily illustrated with strange pictures of alien plants, unknown objects, and the zodiac symbols. But the most interesting aspect of it is the writing. The language used in the text is completely indecipherable. No one knows what it says, who wrote it, or where it was written. We don't even know if it was a real, functional language or if it was just created for this one text. The drawings of different plants are equally intriguing. Most of the plants in the manuscript are identifiable as plants, but they don't match up with any known species. A professor of applied linguistics in England claimed to have deciphered some of the characters in the book. But we haven't managed to uncover any more information about this mysterious text. If you're ever going to head down under, don't forget to pay a visit to the mystery craters in Queensland. Halfway between Bundaberg and Jinjin is one of Australia's most baffling finds, and that's saying quite a lot for Oz. In 1971, the site belonged to a farmer growing zucchini and potatoes. As the farmer tried to expand his farm, he kept hitting large rocks in the fields while plowing. When he took a closer look at the rocks in his way, he found marine fossils and some strange craters. The farmer passed his finds on to geology professors, who set out to research the formations. When the geologists began digging around the area, they uncovered a huge layer of sandstone and ochre stain that was completely covered with craters. There were 35 craters in total, and the layer of rock is estimated to be around 25 million years old. The scientists studying this mystery believe that hot springs, former ocean activity, and meteors are the prime suspects behind the craters. And I'd like to know about the characters who named those towns Bundaberg and Jinjin. <laughs> what fun names! Now, the Antikythera mechanism is an ancient computer of sorts that's still baffling scientists with its extraordinary design. Around 2,000 years ago, a Greek ship sank off the coast of the island of Antikythera. The wreckage was discovered in 1900, and divers salvaged some of its ancient artifacts. When archaeologists started sorting out the discoveries from the wreckage, they came across an object that didn't seem to fit with anything else. The wreckage was ancient, but they found an incredible device that seemed far too technologically advanced. 
The machine functioned as a calculator, allowing its user to follow time, the movement of stars, eclipses, moon phases, and even countdowns to events like the Olympics with amazing precision. This level of technology is almost impossible to explain coming from an ancient Greek wreckage. No mechanism would come close to the machine until the 14th century when geared clocks began to be built in Europe. How was the device created so long ago, 1400 years before its time? Could the sinking of the Antikythera and the loss of the calculator have held the development of technology back by hundreds of years? Meanwhile, the Caucasus Mountains near the Black Sea are one of the few areas of Europe that haven't experienced much human impact, even though most white-skinned people in the world are referred to as Caucasians. Despite this, archaeologists have found many ancient megalithic structures in the area. The house-like structures, known as dolmens, contain jewelry, bronze tools, and assorted pottery. Archaeologists don't know who built them why they built them, or what their true purpose is. The stones were either two stones held together by a large stone as a roof, or smaller stones stacked as walls with a hole only on one side. There have even been stone plugs found that to seal whatever is inside. What's even stranger about these stone formations is that they aren't just found in the Caucasus. They're found all over the planet in Australia, South Korea, Colombia, Africa, and even France. Their purpose is unknown, so all scientists can do is speculate. The discovery of the tomb of the first emperor of China in 1974 is well documented. Who could forget the finding of 8,000 terracotta warriors protecting the entrance? Most of the statues are warriors, each with their own unique facial expressions. There are even full-size terracotta horses and chariots too, just for extra protection. What isn't well known is that some areas of the tomb haven't ever been entered yet. Archaeologists are very reluctant to open the site because the whole area is unstable. There might be something amazing inside, but no one wants to risk losing an amazing piece of history. Eventually, researchers will send tiny robots into the unopened tombs to give a better idea of what's inside. Until then, archaeologists have to wait a little bit longer for the secrets. In southern Costa Rica, people have discovered a collection of mysterious stone spheres. There are over 300 scattered around the landscape, and some are almost 7 feet across. No one knows their purpose or how they were produced. One thing we do know is the material they were made from – gabbro, a volcanic rock. Carving the stones into their perfect spherical shapes would have taken a lot of time and effort. Researchers think they might have been made by a now extinct group, using barely any tools. The best theory is that they used small stones to chisel away at the edges of boulders, before using sand to smooth the sides. Some think that they may have an astronomical purpose, or even used as markers to point the way towards something. But no one knows anymore. Their significance is lost with the civilization that created them. Off the southern tip of Japan, and 75 miles from Taiwan, lies the Yanaguni Formation. A local diver first noticed these formations in 1986, while searching for new dive sites to take tourists. Seeing the large steps that resembled a pyramid, he thought he discovered an underwater city. Some archaeologists believe that the structures could have been signs of a fabled Pacific civilization, like Atlantis, that vanished beneath the waves thousands of years ago. There are also reports of marks in the stone, suggesting quarry work. Some people even claim that there were faded images of humans and animals carved into the stone. None of this is backed with much evidence, though. Most experts believe that the formation is natural, and the symmetry of the rocks has been overstated. They are not as straight as reported, and it appears to be solid natural rock, rather than carved blocks. In other words, the resemblance to a sunken civilization is just a coincidence. In Turkey, archaeologists believe they might have found the oldest known architecture in the world, over 10,000 years old, according to experts. Found in an area that used to be home to ancient farming communities, these monoliths, 
which stood up to 18 feet high, were likely used for social events and rituals. Not much is known about them, though. These large stone structures seem to be human-shaped, with images of animals carved into them. Nearby, researchers have found signs of domestic housing, suggesting that these amazing monuments might have signaled the start of the move towards modern civilization. The Kimbaya artifacts are some of the most interesting artifacts ever found. The most curious thing about them is how closely they seem to resemble modern airplanes. They're so aerodynamic that modern scientists believe they might even be able to be used as blueprints for a functioning aircraft. In 1994, two aeronautical engineers created larger-scale models of these artifacts. They prove that the designs fly with a little help from modern engines. What's really astonishing is that these objects are possibly thousands of years older than the first airplane by the Wright brothers. Just another one of our world's fascinating mysteries. Uh, Now the first rule is not to panic, the guy says. He gives Michael a thick suit. The weather is hot here, and the outfit seems very warm. You can't go without it, he adds. Michael puts on the outfit and feels goosebumps all over his body. Why is it so cold? The guide explains this is a unique cooling cloth. It'll save Michael from heat stroke inside the cave. The guide gives him an oxygen tank and a mask. Are we gonna dive? Michael asks. No, but your lungs may fill up with water if you don't use it. Michael's knees are shaking with fear. He doubts this whole idea. Welcome to one of the most dangerous caves on the planet, the guy says as he enters the dark space at the foot of a mountain. This place is called Crystal Cave, and it's located in Mexico. Magma had leaked here from the hot bowels of our planet 26 million years ago. It was coming and cooling down again and again. There was so much magma that it formed a mountain. Along with magma, mineral-rich water got here. It had been seeping through the rock tunnels and had formed a cave under the hill. Then, something strange appeared in these hot waters. Something that seems to be from another planet. Michael is going down the road. He illuminates the bottomless darkness with a flashlight. The air becomes hot and heavy. Microscopic particles of water are hovering here. Along with a guide, Michael descends to 980 feet. This is more than half of the Empire State Building's height. The air temperature goes up. It feels as if they were approaching the Earth's core. Finally, the descent ends, and they jump on solid ground. The guy puts on an oxygen mask and tells Michael to do the same. He can't breathe in such moist and acidic air. The lungs can fill with water, which will lead to disastrous consequences. The air here feels to Michael as if he's walking through a very thick fog. The temperature rises up to 136 degrees Fahrenheit. It's higher than in the world's most hot deserts. Michael lights his way and notices something big, white, and shiny. It's a huge crystal beam sticking out of the ground that's reaching up. The whole cave is filled with these huge things. They stretch in different directions and rest against the ceiling and the walls. Somewhere they block the path, and somewhere they are like bridges. Michael climbs onto one of the crystals and walks on it. The guide explains that each column is made of gypsum. You know this substance as it's used to produce building material, plasterboard. Michael touches the hard surface of one of them. It seems that some ancient civilization could have built it. The guide says that everything inside this cave is natural. For the first time, this place was discovered by two miners in the year 2000. Since then, scientists have managed to find out that some crystals are 500,000 years old. You can also find one of the largest natural crystals in the world here. This beam is about 36 feet long and weighs 55 tons. This place is filled with water rich in calcium sulfate. This element is capable of forming minerals. A colorless variety of gypsum prevails here. The water and warm air help form the crystals. Humidity and temperature haven't changed for centuries, so these columns continue to grow even now. This place is fascinating. Michael wants to stay here longer to explore the cave, but unfortunately, it's dangerous. They may get lost or slip on the gypsum rocks. Plus, they're running out of oxygen, so they have to climb back up. They come out of the cave and meet the police. 
It turns out that it's prohibited for tourists to enter the cave. Even scientists must get special permission to go here. And it's for a good reason, since the cave is one of the most dangerous places on Earth. Michael and the guy pay a fine and leave Mexico. The next stop is Italy. It's a good thing you've taken a good camera with you, the guide says. This is one of the most fascinating caves in the world. You need the best equipment to capture this beauty. Michael and the guide are on a small boat. They sail along the coast of the island of Capri, Italy. Luckily, there won't be any danger this time. They are approaching a small rift inside the mountain. This is the entrance to the Blue Grotto. The hole is so tiny that only one boat can pass through it. Michael and the guide get into another dimension. The cave is filled with water. The walls are shining with blue light coming from the lake's depths. Michael takes pictures of the cave and notices that the entrance they got through glows with a bright white light. It's the sun's rays illuminating the cave as they enter it. There's another hole under the water. The sunlight penetrates through it, filling the lake with a blue glow. But it's time to move on. The next cave is in New Zealand. They arrive to the North Island. There's a place deep underground with winding, intricate caves. They appeared here about 30 billion years ago. Michael and the guide approach the entrance to the dark cave. Michael turns on a flashlight. Take it away, the guy says. You won't need it inside. They come in. Michael opens his mouth in surprise. The whole cave is filled with glowing lanterns. They are all living creatures, fireflies. They're shining with a blue light. Michael feels like he's on another planet. The entrance to the cave is limited to not harm the fireflies. Scientists use automated equipment to monitor the cave. They watch the temperature and the level of carbon dioxide necessary to maintain the life of glowing beetles. If many people get here, the level of carbon dioxide will increase. The time for a visit is also limited, so they ask Michael and the guide to leave the place. Now, we're going to see something creepy, the guide says. Are you ready? And the next stop is California. The place is called Moaning Caverns. The cave seems quite ordinary from the outside, but the guide looks a little nervous and scared. They attach the rope to the belt and begin the long descent. The bottom is 165 feet deep. It's the height of a 15-story building. It seems not so big compared to the crystal cave. As Michael is going lower, it's getting cold and dark. At this point, all sounds from above disappear. They slowly sink into an ominous silence. What is it? Michael asks, startled. I think I've heard someone's voice downstairs. The guide touches his lips with his finger to keep Michael silent. A long, prolonged human moan is coming from the dark cave depths. In the first seconds, Michael freezes. Then he quickly climbs up along the rope. The guide laughs at him. They hear another moan. Michael gets out of the cave and pulls the guide's rope to get him out. The guide says this is one of the creepiest caves in the world. The air and wind circulate deep inside and create a sound similar to a moan. Tourists often go down there to tickle their nerves. Also, they found about 100 skeletons of ancient people at the bottom of the cave. And no one knows how they got there. Michael doesn't want to go back inside the cave. He asked the guide to tell him how caves form. It turns out that it all starts when the ground absorbs acid rain consisting of water and carbon dioxide. The liquid penetrates through the soil and comes into contact with hard rock surfaces. When water touches limestone or dolomite, it dissolves them and helps to form an empty space. Every year there's more and more space around. The rain continues to fall and accumulate in this open area. Then the water forms a stream or an underground river. After that, the erosion of hard rocks begins. Thousands of years later, there's enough space to fit a human here. Then this space becomes a cave. When erosion combines with stalactites and stalagmites, it forms chambers and impressive columns. By the way, here's the difference between stalactites and stalagmites. Stalactites hang from the ceiling. Stalagmites stick out of the ground. It takes about a million years to develop such underground landscapes. So, every time you walk in these places, 
you come into contact with the ancient past of our planet. No one expected such a strong storm. It's too dangerous to sail back to the land because of high waves and winds. But suddenly, you notice a small green island nearby. You and your friend are about 25 miles off the coast of Brazil. You were fishing and didn't notice black clouds obscuring the blue sky. You're approaching the unknown island and see a Coast Guard boat behind you. People from there are screaming something to you, but you can't make out the words because of the thunder. They tell us we should stay away from that island, your friend says. Despite the warning, you still sail since there's no other way out. Around the island, you notice sharp rocks sticking out of the water like knives in the dark. Now you realize what the Coast Guard warned about, but it's too late. Your boat hits a rock. The bottom is pierced. You start to sink. The rain and wind are getting stronger. Both of you fall overboard. Then darkness comes. You wake up in the morning because of the scorching sun and a dry mouth. Your friend and the wrecked boat are lying nearby. Apparently, you'll have to wait for rescuers to get out here. Now, in the light of day, you can see how dangerous the island's coast is. It's surrounded by rocks, and you're lucky you've survived. Getting out of here will be difficult. Together with your companion, you decide to look for coconuts and bananas. Your friend goes to the wreckage and pulls out a bag of medicine. Then, both of you leave the sandy beach and enter the dense jungle. A couple of steps later, you hear a strange hiss. You see your friend. His eyes are filled with horror. Goosebumps run down your back. You feel something alive crawling under your feet, and there's a lot of it. You look down and notice slithering snakes. There are dozens of them. They wrap around your legs, get into trees. They're everywhere. Don't move, your friend says. I think I know where we are. You want to ask him a question, but fear takes away your voice. He reads your face and answers the question. We're in one of the most dangerous places on Earth, the Brazilian Snake Island. These are not just some ordinary snakes. This is the Golden Lancehead, one of the most venomous reptiles in the world. You can find them nowhere else on the planet except for this land. They evolved here naturally, without other snake species intervention. That made their venom five times stronger than the venom of ordinary vipers. They're practically the only owners of this island. Nowhere else in the world will you find such a concentration of creeping reptiles on such a small piece of land. And now, they're glad that two big lunch meals have arrived. There's little chance of survival, but you're gonna try. The first thing you need to do is get out of your stupor and find a thick stick. This is your best tool right now. If you encounter a venomous snake, the best you can do is retreat slowly. But this time, there are too many of them. They're aggressive and hungry. Together with your friend, you fight off the snakes with a stick. But there's more and more of them coming. One of them falls on your shoulder from a tree and bites your neck. The poison instantly enters your bloodstream and affects your muscles. It feels like your body is melting. It becomes difficult to move and your neck swells. Your friend grabs you and carries you deep into the jungle. Here, among the trees, you notice an old lighthouse. Yeah, this building really stands out here. Once a year, the Coast Guard visits it. Your friend breaks down the door and puts you on the floor. You're afraid you won't be able to survive the bite. Fortunately, your friend is a doctor. He injects the necessary medicine and saves your life. You have a few minutes to rest before more danger arises. Your friend tells you that the unique snakes appeared here thousands of years ago. This island was part of Brazil for a long time. Then, massive floods separated it from the continent. This part of the land was cut off from the whole world, which helped the formation of a unique ecosystem inside. Vipers that lived here evolved into golden lanceheads. They quickly became the main masters of the island and destroyed all the other animals. But how did they manage to survive without food? cut off from the whole world. They did it thanks to nature and evolution. This island is a transit point for many birds. They stop here to rest during long flights. These birds become dinner for the snakes. Previously, a snake bite almost didn't harm the birds. They were frightened and flew away, leaving the snake without food. But over years of evolution, the island's owners have developed such a potent poison 
that one bite was enough for a bird to never take off again. There's also a legend that a pirate hid treasures here a long time ago. And so that no one would ever find it, he brought snakes to guard his gold. Of course, there's no chest with coins here, but the island is attractive for modern pirates, even today. Golden lancehead snakes are an expensive commodity, so bad people often visit this place to hunt the reptiles. That's why the Coast Guard is always on duty around the island. People are forbidden to visit this place. And even if someone manages to get past the guards, they will have to face the rocks. Only biologists and scientists have permission to study the local fauna. A necessary condition for a visit is a doctor's presence in the team, so they can save people from the snake's poison. So we have pirates and hordes of poisonous snakes, but there's something else that makes the island even worse. At this moment, you hear rustling all over the building. Thousands of little paws are tapping on the walls and floor. You look around and see lots of giant cockroaches. Some of them are half the size of your palm. They crawl under your clothes. You and your friends scream in fear and run out of the lighthouse. Quickly, you reach the shore and fall into the water. It seems that not a single cockroach is left under your shirt. But that's not all. You hear a strange buzzing sound. You look around and see a dark cloud of flying beetles forming in the sky. It's locusts! Thousands of flying insects are heading in your direction. To avoid a collision, you dive under the water and wait for the cloud to pass by. You go up to the surface and move to the shore. Fortunately, there are almost no snakes here. You and your friend are afraid to approach the jungle and wait for several hours until rescuers arrive. You're nervously painting a pattern on the sand and make a promise that you'll never revisit this place. Finally, you see the lifeguard boat. You're trying to tell them you got here by accident. They believe you and evacuate you from the island. While you're sailing away, you think about what would happen if many poisonous snakes appeared in a village or a small town. It's difficult to imagine what kind of problems people would face. But in fact, there's no need to imagine anything. There is a place on the planet where locals live next to poisonous cobras, but it doesn't create any chaos. A human can live in peace and harmony with reptiles in that village. Welcome to Shetpal village in India. This place has a population of about 2,600, and it's located in the jungle. It's hot here. Locals are friendly and responsive. If you go into one of the houses, you'll see something <gasps> that seems impossible. The King Cobra, whose venom is one of the most dangerous in the world, calmly crawls around furniture and eats eggs and meat that people give. There's even a special corner for the reptile to relax from the scorching sun, drink water, and have a snack. People are happy about the cobra, as if it was a pet. In the village, cobras are everywhere. They come into houses and schools, crawl through the streets, and keep company during dinner. The locals consider them full-fledged residents. They adore them. The snakes are also used to people and don't see them as dangerous. The coolest thing is there has never been a tragic case in the village because of a poisonous bite. There's no other place in the world where cobras live in such harmony with people. <laughs>